On behalf of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, and we really thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for providing the funding so we could have this discussion today with our distinguished leader in education, Dr. John King, the president and CEO of the Education Trust. Dr. King, it's so good to see you. Good to see you. So listen, man, we're still in the middle of a, a pandemic. Uh, it has affected um, all levels of public education from uh, preschool, uh, K through 12, college, everybody's been affected. But from your uh, perspective, Education Trust, has the education gap widened or has it closed as a result of the pandemic? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it, it's it's widened. And, you know, what we've seen with COVID is really a, a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And we see it from a health standpoint. Uh, black folks are more likely to get COVID, more likely to be hospitalized uh, when they do get COVID, more likely to die from COVID. Um, we see it from an economic standpoint. Um, African Americans have suffered more of the job losses and losses to income uh, proportionally to, to white folks. So not surprisingly, we see similar trends in education. And really, you've got a few things going on. One, uh, internet access is inequitable. And this was true before COVID, we had a digital divide. And now with schools relying on uh, either online or hybrid instruction, students of color have been at a disadvantage. We also know that many of the school districts that serve students of color have less resources. We, we did a report at EdTrust that showed on average, the country spends about $2,000 less on the districts that serve the largest numbers of students of color compared to the districts that serve the fewest. That's a so big that, difference, $2,000 per student? Per student, exactly. So when you have that kind of gap, um, not surprisingly then, districts have less resources to use for professional development, for technology tools. So that's the disadvantage. And then um, folks of color are more likely to have to work outside the home. Only about one in five African-Americans in the workforce can work from home. Only about one in six Latinos can work from home. So kids are home alone or they're home with an older sibling or with a relative. And so they're not getting the same level of support when they're doing their schoolwork at, at home by themselves. So the combined impact of all of this is loss of learning. Projections are from McKinsey, maybe six to 12 months of loss learning. Uh, but also a lot of isolation for kids and a lot of uh, socio-emotional uh, needs that aren't being met. Wow. Well, that's, uh, thank you for a detailed answer. Uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, Dr. King, what are some of the best practices that you can share with the audience to overcome this widening gap? In other words, I think you cited several issues, but let's start with the distance learning um, the, the disparity in broadband, um, how can parents in particular uh, help their young people get access uh, to the technology in order for distance education? Because it looks like the pandemic is still going to be with us for a while. That's I right. know they're trying to reopen school. They're doing different models to see what works, what doesn't work. But at the end of the day, we do have to be concerned about the health of the students, but also the health of the teachers, That's the health right. of the administrators, because if everybody gets the um, uh, a new round of uh, COVID, then it defeats the whole purpose. Yes, that's right. That's right. Well, look, you know, we've got to put pressure on elected officials, governors, mayors, county executives to get internet access to everyone. I mean, this this really should have been an urgent national mission so even, even before COVID. Even that's before right. COVID. That's right. Really, that's true. Exactly. Even before yeah. COVID. That's right. That's right. So we've got to get internet access. We've got to get devices to students. Um, and you really need a, a device for each child in the household. I mean, we still have families where there's maybe there's one device, but that's the device that multiple kids are using for school, that mom's using uh, for work, that dad's using to access telehealth. You know, right. so you really need a device for each child. Uh, some school districts have really focused on that and, and are making sure kids have devices, but unfortunately, not all school districts. 
So we've got to really get those two things in place. And if, if parents have, have, are in a situation where they don't have a device, they really have to go to their school district and ask and see if they can get a device for, their, for each of their children. Um, once we solve that, then we've got to have school districts providing more support to teachers around the online learning, uh, mm -hmm. professional development. You know, some school districts are asking people to juggle working with students at home at the same time as they're trying to teach the students in the classroom without any additional support. Um, hopefully, President Biden's proposal for $130 billion of additional support for K-12 schools. Hopefully that goes through in the next few weeks and hopefully that helps then. Is that part of the uh, American Rescue uh, Plan? Exactly, exactly. 130 billion for K-12 is part of that 1.9 trillion. Um, and you know that should cover things like internet, devices, tutoring, I hope, to try to provide more support to students who've fallen behind. Hopefully some funding that can be used for summer school and summer enrichment activities. Right. You know, assuming we're able to get back in person this summer 21, and then again, we'll need that time in summer 2022 20, to help students catch up. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems to me that since uh, all students are behind, particularly uh, students of color, there needs to be probably some long range program so that we can catch up. Because yeah, right. even after the schools uh, become open, there's this, um, uh, how can I say, missing points of, uh, of significant uh, educational instruction that has to be made up in some way. That, that, uh, yeah, right. We may not just have to have the traditional nine months. We may have to go 12 months uh, to try to catch up with some of the loss. What's your feeling on that? That's right. I, I'm very strongly in support of additional time. I mean, it's the only way we're going to really help make up for, for the lost instruction that students have experienced. But I hope what people will do is design really high quality summer programs that mix academics with arts, with athletics, with science experiments, with internships, so mm. that young people want to be there and are fully engaged. And I think we can be creative in the design of summer. Actually, Randy Weingarten, the president of the AFT, and I wrote an op-ed together back in spring of 20, calling for a major national investment in summer school. The other thing I'd love to see is a national tutoring corps. I'd love to see us um, invest in particularly recent college graduates as well as retired teachers as a potential tutoring uh, workforce that could then work with students in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, help them catch up academically, but also build positive relationships. Listen, that's a good segue. Tell us the mission, I want all our viewers to know, of the Ed Trust. Yeah, so our, our mission is education equity for low income students and students of color, and we work in both P through 12 education and higher education. And we do a mix of research and advocacy uh, to try to close the opportunity gaps that our students face. Very good. Is there a particular website where parents and students could go to find uh, resources or programs to help them uh, during this pandemic? Yes, edtrust.org is our website. Uh, and we've got a number of resources there, um, research that could help inform uh, the decisions that districts make, but also tools that parents and advocates can use to ask the right questions of their school district and their local elected officials around how they're helping to close opportunity gaps. Well, well you know, Dr. King, um, this is a sort of a uh, contextual question. Since uh, the tragedy of George Floyd, mm -hmm. uh, all the major corporations and uh, municipal governments, county governments, even federal government, I just listened to a hearing today, everybody's discussing um, how to move forward with more equity, more social justice, the whole issues of diversity and inclusion. But from your perspective, how's the teaching profession, how's the education industry uh, look when it comes to are we becoming much more diverse, uh, much more inclusive? Or what does the pipeline look like for teachers? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, so far that the, those statements are more rhetoric than reality, and that that's okay. that's the that's the sad truth. So, majority of kids in the nation's public schools are kids of color, but only eighteen percent of our teachers are teachers of color. Only two percent of our teachers are African American men. Only two so percent. 2%, oh, wow. right? So if you say 
you care about racial justice, you believe Black Lives Matter, but you don't have Black teachers, then the words ring a little bit hollow. Yes. Right? And that's a pipeline problem at every level. You know, it starts with that students of color are less likely to graduate from high school, less likely to go on to college, less likely to major in education, less likely to graduate with a teaching degree, less likely to be hired in school districts, and less likely to stay once hired compared to their white peers. So we really need uh, all hands on deck strategy that helps get high school students excited about becoming teachers, that helps get community college students excited about becoming teachers and helps them transition into four year programs that reaches out to folks who are paraprofessionals and coaches and behavioral specialists working in schools who just need a few more credits so they, they can get that degree so they can become teachers. Uh, and then we need to have programs to help support people so that they want to stay. Uh, you know, I think about an effort in Montgomery County, Maryland, where I live, called the Bond Project, which mm -hmm. is about creating a community amongst teachers of color so that folks can support each other, have an affinity group, if you will, so that so that they want to stay in the district. I, I know that a lot of people watching our program, they uh, have jobs, but they're considering uh, uh, second careers. Hmm. Can you talk about the opportunities for people who are engineers or medical who are even lawyers? Uh, you know, if they think about changing career, uh, tell us about the opportunities in the teaching profession. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, they should really go to their local teacher preparation institution and figure out what are the courses they would need in order to qualify for a teaching certificate. Um, but there are a lot, a lot of programs growing around the country. I think about the New York City Teaching Fellows, for example, that are designed to help people make the career shift to teaching. And we need more of those people, particularly in the STEM fields. We need more engineers and scientists. Maybe they've had a whole career and then they want to come over to teach. Yes. Uh, there are also some programs for folks who are uh, retiring from the military or leaving the military and would like to become teachers. Uh, that's another potential pathway, um, but the opportunity to have an impact in a child's life, there's really nothing better than that. Speaking as a, as a former high school social studies teacher, um, there's really few things in life as satisfying as that moment that where you see that spark of learning and engagement from a student. That's great. Uh, for the past four years, there's been somewhat of a federal not necessarily a standstill, but almost a retreat from strong advocacy of, of public schools that are leaning toward more privatization of education mm -hmm. rather than and away from public schools. Uh, they just sworn in the new um, uh, Secretary of, of Education, at least he passed uh, the Congress, the Senate. Uh, what's your view of, uh, of the prospects over the next four years vis-a-vis um, -vis the Department of Education and say working with Ed Trust and working with the teachers union, you know, all the different stakeholders, what's your yeah. prospect of the future of public education in America? Yeah, I, I'm very hopeful. I really, I think Miguel Cardona, the new, new secretary is very passionate about equity issues. Um, you know, really came up through the system was it was a was a teacher and a principal and administrator and district and then at the state level. So really has good perspective on what the opportunities and challenges are. President Biden and, and Dr. Biden, uh, his wife, are very committed to public schools. Um, I think we can expect new investment. You know, there, there'll be this $130 billion in the American Rescue Plan, but then I expect them to make even more long-term investments. President Biden talked during the campaign about tripling Title I. That right. would make a huge difference uh, for low-income communities and, and the schools that, that, that are located in low-income communities. Uh, Dr. Biden teaches at community college, believes in community college. Majority of students of color start their, edu their higher education in community college. She'll want to make investments there. I'm sure she's going to encourage the president to, to put resources there. So I'm, I'm very hopeful about the direction we're headed in. Well, that's good. That's, that's um, good to know. Um, in terms of uh, future projects, uh, what would you state in 2021 is the number one priority of uh, the Education Trust? Yeah, look, I, I think our top priority has to be helping students get 
back on track, uh, addressing the learning loss from COVID, but also uh, addressing the socio-emotional and mental health needs that have emerged during this period. Uh, once we do that, then I think we've got to really tackle some of the underlying equity issues that existed before COVID. Digital divide, we already talked about. Uh, discipline disparities for students of color, uh, where students of color are more likely to be suspended from school than their white peers. Uh, taking on inequitable access to advanced coursework. You know, we see that students of color are underrepresented in AP classes, international baccalaureate programs, uh, underrepresented in eighth grade algebra, gifted and talented programs. We have a lot of work to do there. Uh, we see that Black and Latino students are underrepresented in selective admission public colleges, colleges whose mission is to serve the population of their state aren't really doing that. They, they, they need to do a much better job. So if we get past, as we get past COVID, uh, we've really got to then redirect our attention to these underlying equity challenges. Well, as you know, um, Dr. King, we represent the Black Press of America and we reach into a lot of communities across the United States and I just want to say that the NMPA, we want to continue to work close with you and the Ed Trust. I'm even thinking about, you know, doing maybe having a, a weekly education column. I think that's just so vital. Uh, you know, back in the day, we used to say education determines one's liberation. Mm -hmm. Education determines one's uh, future. And uh, I want to make sure that we don't let other clouds cloud over the issue of the importance of a high quality education uh, as, as, as early as, as you can start to, to lay a strong foundation. Uh, before we close out, could you just uh, emphasize uh, for the audience how important uh, uh, a high quality education would be uh, for uh, Generation Z, uh, the millennials, and for the, the families who are struggling right now trying to get priorities. I know first priority is to keep everybody healthy mm -hmm. and safe from the uh, pandemic. But in the context of the COVID-9 pandemic, can you just articulate from your perspective the importance of uh, public education? Yeah, sure. Well, look, it's, it's the foundation for our democracy and our future economic prosperity as a country, right? Uh, you cannot have a healthy democracy if your uh, people are not well educated and able to participate in the political process. And you can't have a prosperous economy if you aren't prepared to compete for 21st century jobs. And we're not just competing uh, within the United States, we're competing uh, with countries all over the world uh, for the best jobs. And so we really need to focus on ensuring equitable educational opportunity. It's transformative in a young person's life. If you look at the unemployment data today, there really are very few jobs for folks who have less than a high school diploma. And for that matter, very few jobs that provide a good wage that you can get with only a high school diploma. You really need some level of post-secondary education. Now, that might be an associate's degree, could be a bachelor's degree, could be post-secondary career training right. in a high demand field. But you need that as a sort of passport to economic opportunity. And I'll tell you, you know, and, and you and I've talked about this before, I, I always point out to people, education saves lives. Uh, my, my life was saved by schools. Both, yes. both my parents passed when I was a kid, my mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. If not for phenomenal New York City public school teachers who gave me a sense of hope and purpose, I'd be in, in, in prison or dead today, right? They, they made that investment. They gave me that sense that I could go on, that there could be a better future for me. And for kids who have been without school, some kids haven't logged in since last March. Uh, this could be a this this is a this is a crucial moment. We've got yes. to intervene and help students get what they need. Well, Dr. John King, thank you so much for joining the National Newspaper Publishers Association. Uh, we wish you well. We wish uh, the Ed Trust well. And I can say, uh, from my personal knowledge, and I've witnessed uh, the great work that you continue to do in the education uh, field. Uh, that those teachers in New York that invested in you, that was a great investment. And now you are reinvesting your time, your talent, your expertise, and generations to come. So on behalf of the NMPA, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for your leadership on so many social justice issues, not only education, but criminal justice reform and just the whole range of needs in our in our community. Well, and, thank uh, you. We, we will stay engaged. And uh, I, I want to say that at some point, let's work together. I would love to get the new Secretary of Education on so that he can address the constituents constituencies that we serve. Yes, love that. Let's definitely do that. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. King. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you.